This video is dedicated to Fechner's Law. And Fechner's Law is one of the more intimidating things in the study of sensation and perception, but you're going to find it in lots of different areas of psychology, like in numerology, whenever you're studying cognition, in emotional studies, and even in psychopharmacology. So we're going to focus on understanding what is Fechner's Law. I'm going to give you some real life examples to show how it applies to your everyday life. I'm going to graph it out using some, some beautiful illustrations, and then we're going to plug in some numbers so we can see how the math works uh, that underlies this law. But first, let me give you an example. Okay, so let's say that your friend needs your help. So we got you and we got your friend. Let's say that your friend's name is Chad and Chad has a bunch of books that he wants you to carry. Uh, so you see the stack of books right here. He's gonna start handing you some books. And so first he says, hey, uh, could you uh, carry some books for me? And being the good friend that you are, you say, Sure, W-E, heart emoji, LOL, hashtag squad goals. And so he's gonna, he's gonna start passing you some books. Okay, so let's say that this time you have one book in your hands already, and he's gonna pass you this blue book right here. So he throws it in your arms, and now you have two books, and you're thinking to yourself, hey, I noticed a change in weight. I noticed that the load that I'm carrying got a little bit heavier. In fact, it got twice as heavy, and so you notice this change pretty easily. So you add one book, and you notice a change in weight. It seems pretty simple, right? But it's not that simple. Because what if we are carrying a load of books? What if we're carrying a lot of books all at once? Now this time Chad is gonna throw this book right on top of this pile. And this time, instead of thinking that you felt a really big change, you're feeling that you barely felt it. This, this time you just noticed a slight difference in the weight that you're carrying. And that's because you were already carrying a pretty heavy uh, load. This is Fechner's Law in action. But first, Let's back up and let's talk about where Fechner's Law comes from. It is kind of the core of psychophysics. And what is psychophysics? I know it sounds really scary because it sounds like maybe there's some kind of murderous physicist on the loose, a psychophysicist, but it's not that exciting. Well, actually it is that exciting, but it's not gonna be that dramatic. Uh, psychophysics is a branch of psychology. It's a branch of sensation and perception that's particularly looking to find out how objective things in the real world that we can measure, that we can touch, that we can weigh, uh, how it affects our subjective experience. So in other words, how is what you subjectively experience on a day-to-day -day basis, how can you measure that by looking at the objective inputs that you get? So uh, that's the basic definition, but let's look at where Fechner's Law came from. Let's look at the history of it. So let's talk about these two guys. Let's talk about Ernst Weber and Gustav Fechner. And I know that's not the way that their names look. Imagine that uh, this guy on the left, imagine that his name starts with a V and this guy on the right with the mullet, let's say that his name uh, has a K somewhere in there. Uh, but really the hero of this story is gonna be Gustav Fechner because even though Fechner's Law uses something called the Weber Fraction, the Weber Fraction is so named not because Ernst Weber invented it, but simply because Gustav Fechner decided to kind of honor his mentor, uh, honor his uh, the, the person who taught him everything. So he named this fraction that he discovered after him. And Fechner's Law obviously is named after him. And you can demonstrate Fechner's Law with this simple equation. S equals K multiplied the log of R. But hey, that's math. Let's get that out of the way. We don't care about that. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Okay, so here is a basic demonstration of Fechner's Law, or at least an illustration of it. Uh, pretty simple, right? It's just a curve on a graph. How hard can it be? But what you're looking at here on the y-axis, so going up and down, we're going to have changes in your perception, changes in your subjective experience of the stimulus that you're perceiving. Down here at the bottom on the x-axis, we have stimulus strength. So in other words, how strong, how objectively strong is the stimulus that is being measured? And this is is something that you can measure. It's not, a, it's not subjective. It's something that you can uh, use a ruler or a weight or a scale or something to measure. So to interpret this graph, what we can look at is that moving up, uh, we are increasing our perception, our subjective experience of the stimulus, uh, where the, the higher the value, the stronger we perceive it to be. Whereas on the x-axis, as we move farther to the right, that stimulus becomes heavier or brighter or saltier. Um, so over on the right, we have the strongest or the highest levels of that stimulus strength. And so where do these values come from? Where did this 
like this whole curve come from? Basically, let's say that we have a stimulus strength that's pretty weak. We have it right down here at the end, so we're dealing with a very weak stimulus. On this curve, we're going to be feeling about right here, which means that we're not really experiencing a whole lot of the perception of this stimulus. And I know I'm keeping it really amorphous right now, but I'm going to give you some more examples in just a second. Now let's say that we increase the stimulus strength by just a little bit. So we're increasing that stimulus strength by just a little bit. And you can kind of see that this arrow is now going to correspond with a different part on this curve. We have it pulling up. And so now we're going to be perceiving something a little bit higher so we can detect that this was, you know, a noticeable increase in the signal strength. So we have, you know, about this much. We can really feel the difference going on here when we increase that stimulus strength by this much when we start out with it really, really low. But that's not always the case. What if we start with a stimulus that's much stronger? So we're starting over here farther on the x-axis now. That's going to lead to a stronger subjective experience of that stimulus. So now we're way up here on the curve, but let's move it by the same amount this time. Let's move it by just a little bit. So we're moving it we're increasing that stimulus strength by the same amount that we increased it last time, but this time there's not really all that much a difference in our subjective experience of it. And so you can kind of see the difference that I'm drawing out here. Compare that to what we just saw and you can see, hey, there's a pretty big difference in our perceived strength of that stimulus. In other words, our perception of that, how much it weighs, how bright it is, how salty it is, how loud it is, when we start at this really high value, we don't really detect changes all that easily. So we can barely feel the difference here. Now let's relate this back to our example. So your perception of how heavy these books are is going to be related to the number of books that you're carrying. So the less books that you have, each additional one is going to change how much you feel the weight that you're carrying is by a pretty good bit. But if you're starting out with a lot of books, remember whenever Chad handed you that huge load of books, you don't detect each individual subsequent book nearly as much. And this leads us to our take home message, which is the greater stimulus is, the more you need of it in order to detect a change. Go ahead and write that down, put stars by it, take a highlighter out and rub it all over your computer screen because this is the most important thing about this video is this sentiment right here. But okay, let's go through another example. And I have coffee on the mind, so let's talk about coffee. Can you detect the difference between a cup of coffee that's black, that has no cream and sugar in it, and a cup of coffee that only has one packet of sugar in it? I bet that you can't. If you don't believe me, you can try it out yourself, pour yourself two cups of coffee, put one sugar in one, and I bet that you can tell a difference there. Uh, but let's try something else. Let's try a cup of coffee with eight sugars and a cup of coffee with nine sugars. Can you tell the difference between these two? You probably won't be able to. And the reason why is because, like we just said in the take home message, the greater the stimulus is, the more you need of it in order to detect a change. So if you have these two cups of coffee that are loaded up with sugar, you're going to need a lot more sugar than just one packet in order to detect a difference between those two cups. And here's the important thing that in both of those scenarios that I just gave you, the only difference was one lousy sugar. We can detect that one lousy sugar in one case when we're starting out with no sweetness, but when we're starting out with high levels of sweetness, we can't really detect a difference. So you can go ahead and graph this out if you want to. There, when we started out with no uh, uh, sweetness right here and we added just one, then we, in we increased uh, our perception of that sweetness. But if we start out with a really high amount, let let's say right around here, the number of sugars in our coffee, uh, our perception of it is gonna rank up here, but each subsequent packet of coffee, we are gonna detect less of an increase in our subjective experience there. So I like both of those examples, but I know they're probably not great for everybody because this is a video format, right? You need something that's visual, but don't worry, I got you. So let's say that we start out with this square. I'm gonna give you another square and it's gonna be increased by simply one, in one inch of length. All right, you can detect a pretty big difference between these two, right? Effectively, I've doubled this square. But let's say that we start out with these two rectangles right here. They look pretty similar, right? They don't look as drastically different as these first two, even though we have an increase of just one inch in length. Now, in both of these cases, we're only adding 
just this much. So we're only adding this square. We detect it very easily when we're starting out with these smaller, shorter squares. When we are looking at these longer lengths though, it doesn't look like the square gives as much to it. I can give you another example. So let's say uh, that we want to count the number of circles here. So I'm going to give you these circles. I don't want you to count them. Don't pause the video. Don't count these. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add five circles below. Okay, so uh, abracadabra, and now we have uh, five circles extra compared to these top squares. Now, in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see a pretty big difference in what you see in the top left square. But in the bottom right square, you don't detect nearly as much as you do in the top right. So on the left, yeah, we can detect a pretty big difference when we add these five circles, and that's because we start out with a really small amount. But on the right, we start out with a larger amount, and we don't detect as easily those five additional circles. So even though the examples that we just talked about look at vision, touch, and taste, it's important to think about that Fechner's law applies to all of our senses. It applies to smell, and it applies to our sense of orientation. It applies to volume and sound as well. All right, so trigger warning. Here is the math part. The math part is not as intimidating as it looks. And I know if you're like me, you see this and you don't see any numbers and you start your palms start to get sweaty. You don't know what's going on. The world starts spinning. That's okay, let's break it down. The S here is what we are trying to calculate. This is gonna be the value on the Y axis. So this is the stimulus's perceived strength. The K is gonna be the Weber fraction. The Weber, Weber fraction is gonna be a constant that depends really on what sense it is that you're measuring. And you're gonna multiply this by the log of R, which is gonna be the objective stimulus strength of whatever modality we are measuring. Okay, maybe that didn't help. Let's break it down even further. So basically, this is what we have. You get the log of the stimulus strength. So let's say that you have the value of weight. You can measure this in pounds or in, or in, uh, in grams. Uh, you can look at brightness. You can measure that in lumens. You can look at sound. You can measure that in decibels. You can plug that in. You're gonna get the log value, the log transformation of that value. You're gonna multiply that by the constant fraction, the vapor fraction for that sense. And whatever that result is, that's gonna be the perceived stimulus strength. See, that wasn't so hard, right? And that's it. That's Fechner's Law in a nutshell.